Hello, I'm conductor Raffaele Ponti, and this is Behind the Notes. Today, my special guest is the amazing pianist, Terrence Wilson. Welcome, Terrence. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you for doing this. My pleasure. So let's, let's get right to it. You have an amazing career. Was it a musical family that you came from, a single person, an inspiration, or an experience that got you into, into music? Well, actually, I'd have to say it, it was really a combination of all of the above. Um, my parents, before they got married, were uh, respectively uh, rock and rollers in their day, going back to- <laughs> hey, hey, man. There you go. <laughs> back in the 60s, my mother, uh, she was the lead singer in a girl band called Baby Jane and the Rockabies, and she was Baby Jane. Wonderful. And my father was um, in a doo-wop a cappella group, <laughs> and, um, and they were known as the, the Wilson brothers. There were five brothers. Um, so they would be on tour, and their groups would run into each other on various tours, such as the Apollo Theater in New York City. Wow. And uh, that's how they that's how they met and fell in love and got married and had us. Um, so that was so. So that's the sort of the, the uh, you know, genetics or, the, you know, <laughs> sure. for, for musicality. I don't know what chromosome it's on, but, you know, different <laughs> genre, mind you. <laughs> Did you hear their music and them performing or rehearsing in your home? Um, I, well, you know, my brother, my older brother, who has all of the, the family archives at his house, um, he has, uh, my mother's old, um, 45 LPs, wow. um, uh, of, uh, you know, their, their big singles that they sang back in the day, uh, produced by Phil Spector of all people. <laughs> no kidding. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so. I didn't catch I didn't catch the, the rock and roll or the you know or the doo wop gene, um, um, <laughs> but uh, but music overall was always in the home and um, I, I I always I think that was part of my early pedigree, um, but then uh, my discovery of classical music was just sort of circumstantial I you know. Uh, when I was 10 years old, my mom decided she was gonna buy a, a radio for me. Um, and I happened to turn on the radio when I was playing with the dial and I discovered um, WNCN, which back in those days was one of, I think three or four classical stations in New York City. And I remember hearing the first thing I heard on WNCM. And it wow. was Vladimir, Vladimir <laughs> Horowitz was playing Chopin's oh. first ballad in G minor. <laughs> How could you not fall in love with that instrument? <laughs> and I just and I just sat there, just mesmerized by what I was hearing. And so, so that was my discovery of classical music, which sort of coincided with uh, my first piano acquisition. Uh, my mother decided around that same time and she was gonna buy a lovely piece of furniture to complement the painting in the living room. Um, and that piece of furniture was the form of a piano. <laughs> <laughs> Don't so, mention the brand. Don't mention the brand. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, uh, but in any case, um, uh, so I've got this piano now. 
and I've got this new love for Chopin. Hey, mom, can I start taking piano lessons? <laughs> and, you know, the rest is history. That's amazing. Talk us through a little bit now, uh, your first piano teacher, because I know you have an amazing teacher. You had an amazing teacher at Juilliard. Was there yeah. a teacher before that, or did you begin right away at Juilliard? Oh, no, I, I, I studied for quite a while with a neighborhood, um, a local community piano teacher um, where I grew up in the Bronx. And um, I studied with her. She was a Juilliard graduate herself. And um, I studied with her for uh, maybe three or four years or so before I auditioned for who would become my major teacher at Juilliard, Veda Kaplinsky. Right. And um, so um, by the time, by the time I got to Juilliard uh, at the college level, I had already studied with Veda Kaplinsky for maybe three or four years privately as well as um, in the pre-college division at both the Manhattan School of Music and the Juilliard School. Wow, okay, was she teaching at both? Well, she, yes, not necessarily concurrently, but, uh, but uh, so one you went, after you the went other. With First the was Manhattan you, School of Music, and then, and then uh, she uh, started teaching at Juilliard, and of course I followed her. Well, of course. You know, when you find the teacher that inspires you and is giving you the right instruction musically, uh, you stick with it. That's really oh, important. It's absolutely. not the building, it's the teacher, don't you agree? Oh, oh, absolutely. It, it absolutely is. Um, and I think it's a beautiful story when you mention, you know, it was uh, a local teacher from your neighborhood that started you, you know, the whole thing and gave you obviously a great foundation because the beginning is very, very important. And it reminds me of how many wonderful music educators are out there mm -hmm. that are starting hundreds and thousands of children every day on a musical instrument. And those people really need the applause because they're doing great things for kids, whether they become an artist to your level or just the appreciation of the education and music in general, they'll at least know that it's out there. Yes, yeah. And I think those people really are doing great things in, in the field. Your, your years now at Juilliard uh, were, were quite form wonderful for you, but what happens after Juilliard? Well, you know, after, after I left Juilliard, I, I, um, I was really, enjoying a very active career, concertizing and touring. Um, and um, it, uh, it just sort of flourished, um, you know, and I, I had a couple of other things that I um, started to do, which is chamber music. And I joined um, uh, a Florida based uh, chamber music uh, based at a chamber music organization, chamber music ensemble, the Ritz Chamber Players based in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, I seem to have a lot of ties to Florida. <laughs> I see that. You like nice weather, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I love my people, though. Any, yeah, yeah, we don't we don't talk much about the Antarctica Mus Chamber Music Festival that much, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's or the true. Alaska Winterfest. That's know, it's right. It's always Florida. Yeah, so that's nice. right. Um, so uh, so you, you also have a, a love for chamber music. I also and, have a love for, yeah. You know, I as a conductor, I realized that chamber music is such an element for artists to play in because I think that's when the real music making happens. You know, you're not under uh, a guidance or... Uh, the leadership of a conductor telling you how to play something or to shape a phrase or this is the tempo I want, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Uh, unless there's a really wonderful chemistry like I believe you and I have, because we've collaborated several times and it's always been to an artistic level that I still cherish. Uh, but the thing is, chamber music is where the real music making happens. Don't you agree with that? Absolutely. Um, chamber music represents um, the kind of dialogue and interaction um, and um, 
listening and responding intuitively um, that I find I often try to emulate even in my solo piano performances. You know, you have to, your, your ego is at the door. You leave that before you walk in the door, um, you know. And because it involves other, uh, presumably, you know, well-educated, impassioned, thoughtful musicians with very strong opinions about how to play the damn the damn thing, <laughs> right? Right. Right. Um, that that lends itself to real outright arguments and fights. You know, some of the greatest chamber music ensembles of the world, you know, have had outright fights. You know, where they would just call off the rehearsal and just, you know, go their separate ways for like two or three days. <laughs> and I bet you those were some of the most exciting performances of any piece of chamber music, you know, that one uh, could ever hear. And so, you know, I was, I was pretty new to chamber music when I joined uh, the Ritz Chamber Players. You know, I'd had this career of playing concerto appearances and recitals and what have you. So, um, it was definitely a very steep learning curve because um, I was honored to be, you know, making music and, and learning the repertoire, exploring the repertoire with really high caliber artists um, uh, with a group, um, you know, Tahira Whittington, uh, wonderful cellist based in Chicago, wow. Kelly Hall Tompkins, uh, an amazing violinist right. uh, based in New York City. Um, just, uh, you know, a wealth of really high class uh, musicians. And it's, it's taught me well. It was part of my post Juilliard training, you know. I, I would tend to agree with that because I think, you know, like, for example, even in your playing right now of the Chopin, the way you played it to me has so much breath in it. And it's like Horowitz would have played it, where after that initial attack, <laughs> it has to do this yeah and you wait for it and i think that's just that element of being a great musician a great chamber musician to allow things to uh to settle you know as a musician i think we're afraid of silence sometimes mm -hmm. and i think silence is so so important in music yeah would you yes. play that would you play that opening phrase one more time Sure, yeah. So we can hear that silence? Yes. Um, Beautiful. That's you know, exactly. That silence is as much a part of the music as the sound. And I once had a coaching um, uh, with a dear friend of mine, Greg Beaver, a wonderful um, um, uh, cellist um, who studied at Juilliard during my time. And we had a coaching with this teacher one time, and he said, Think of the silence, not as the absence of something, but rather the presence of something else. Uh, there's, wow. a, there's, a, there's a pregnancy there, you know, um, in the silences. And um, it, just, it just grips you and holds you and you know, you're, aching to find out what's going to happen next you know <laughs> that's, that's a wonderful way to put it wonderful way to think of it too and it's apparent in your playing would you do us a favor would you uh one of the things i love about your playing is that um it's the precise way you play the elegance in your playing is something that i find stunning the taste 
and I love your Bach. And I mean, this is a total compliment. I'm a big, um, a big fan of, of Bach and, and that music. Would you do me a favor and play a little bit of your Bach? Sure. Oh, this is from the, uh, the uh, second uh, English suite in A minor. Bravo, bravo. Thank That's you. Just stunning, and we don't really get the, the full uh, caption of the whole thing because of Zoom, it doesn't really capture the beautiful yeah. sound that you're getting. We get a little bit of it, but it's just wonderful playing. And what comes to my mind is Glenn Gould when you play, because oh. uh, I find it to be so clean and, and clear, yet there's a wonderful line always there. And that's oh, a hard achievement. That's a hard achievement to get both of those things without making it either choppy or too legato. So, oh, thank you. I, I, you know, my, my piano teacher, Veda Kaplinsky, um, um, is quite the Bach uh, expert and uh, virtuoso. And um, I'm still trying to live up to um, her tutelage. Um, well, she, she did but, well. She did well. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Terry? What do you think Bach would think uh, if he heard his music being played on this instrument? Oh, I think he would. I think he would find it delightful. Um, yeah, I absolutely. I, I I think he. I think he would find it delightful. He would hear the the possibilities of range and 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 dynamic and um i think it'd be very excited because it's even the colors are are, are larger or different at least with yeah English, you know the, the the colors now what is your thought on you know once in a while i'll hear a young student come in or, or even uh when i'm coaching conductors in this type of thing. And they look for like music in the Baroque period or I'll say Bach, and they tend to play it very stiff or wicky ticky because ah. they think that that's the way it should be played. And unfortunately that may be some of the thinking out there. What's your thought on that? Because I personally feel that you could play it almost romantically sometimes and it still works. Uh -huh. Is that well, crossing that, that... the line? Is that crossing the line artistically? Well, I, you know, I, I do believe that I do believe it's important to respect the bound the stylistic bounds or the the, the parameters of a particular um, style uh, of practice because it after all that is that's that's what we are um, trying to do as classical musicians right we're trying to preserve certain traditions and certain styles. Um, um, and, and the thing about that is, you know, if you have, you know, a piece of art, uh, you know, a piece of Renaissance or Baroque art, 
right? That's it. You know, it's tangible. You know, right. you can see it and it's there. Um, but music, which is, um, you know, evaporates into thin air um, once the sound is gone, um, it's, it's, it's a lot more elusive to, to capture that. So, so everything is, is with nuance. Um, you have to have a, a very, very, you know, the kinds of liberties that you can take with Bach, they are there. They are there and they should be uh, practiced, but they're much, much more subtle than the liberties that you might take in playing a piece by Rachmaninoff, for example. Now um, that you mentioned that, would you show <laughs> like us- Like my little segue there. <laughs> would you? <laughs> <laughs> this commercial brought to you by- <laughs> Absolutely. I'll play just a few bars of the opening of the um, the A2 Tableau Opus 39, number six in E flat minor. Wonderful. Again, we don't really get the, the, the beauty of the sound uh, because yeah. of the zoom, but uh, yeah. it looks and sounds amazing. Thank you for doing that. Now, maybe some of our viewers don't know about pedaling on the instrument, and that's a real important aspect of how to play and, and, and what you're playing. What would the differences be in pedaling the Bach piece as opposed to pedaling for Rachmaninoff? Well, in... in um you have to consider that there were certain limitations of the instruments uh, back in, uh, in Bach's time um, where you didn't have the modern piano with, the, with even you know, the uh, sostenuto pedal and what have you. Um, and that informed a lot of things, right? Because even the, even the, uh, the strings, um, weren't made of the same material that they are now, right? So this, so the the sound, um, the duration of the sound, um, it had a very rapid rate of decay compared to today, where you you know, um, so so all of that means that uh, in box music you you might play a little bit faster because the rate of decay. Um, is so fast, it's harder to connect the notes when you play too slow, right? So that's one, that's one element of it. The other element of it is with the pedal. Um, the pedal is really, um, well, the pedal can be applied um, for several reasons. Uh, one of which I, con I consider cheating. Um, <laughs> if you're trying to use the pedal, some of my, some of my young students, they try to use the pedal, um, um, to help in legato. So if they have a very wide gap <laughs> or a very, a very, um, a very big interval. Or need the time to, 
or need the time to find the right key. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> then they'll they'll use then they'll use the um the pedal for that um but i'm not a fan of that um um i think the pedal really more is for timbre um and um and there are certain for example i'm playing the greek concerto um this weekend and there's a part in the in the cadenza um, in the first movement, where you have this thing, you know, of course, the, the theme is right. Well, in the cadenza, um, you have this big um, crescendo based on that thing. Right. And then you get to this. And then there's a part where um, you have to play. So this is this is a fragment of the theme. Um, so this is. And it's a very tricky thing because you have to, after this big run, right? It has to disappear and what's left is the note from the fragment of the theme. <laughs> so how, so without the pedals, how do you do that? <laughs> well, you don't. <laughs> now, uh, the concert hall makes a difference in that also. If it's a very live concert hall or if it's yes. a very dry concert hall, th that all depends on the time you put in there. Is that correct? To get the same effect? Oh, yes. Yes. All of that plays a part in, um, in the performance, uh, which is why, ideally, if you can have some time in the hall to learn the, the acoustic properties of the hall, um, then, you know, that can help you gauge how much time to let those little phrases linger you know and that sort of thing um but even and, at that you know, when the audience arrives it changes a little bit again absolutely so even during a live performance you and i on the stage and well the musicians too they're we're constantly listening and judging how is it going how was that did that work is yes. this tempo right for this hall is this tempo right for that instrument Right. And that's that's interesting. And, you know, my piano teacher, she used to say something um, which might sound controversial, but I think um, in, in theory and in practice and philosophically, it's absolutely on on target. Don't give 100 percent of yourself. Give 99 percent of yourself, because at least one percent of yourself needs to be out there in the audience, gauging how the sound that you're producing is translating, right? Because you can be, you know, writhing in, you know, <laughs> in your own moment on the stage doing it, but if it's not communicating, if it's not translating um, outward to the audience, it doesn't work. That's a terrific philosophy, actually. Really great. Which means you have to buy 1% of a ticket to sit out there. <laughs> well, actually, I've got the best ticket in. I've got the best seat in the house. <laughs> you know, uh, as a pianist, you don't have the luxury of like a fiddle player or a flute player jumping in an airplane with your instrument. You're a, a victim of circumstance because you have to arrive and play somebody else's instrument. Mm -hmm. what, is the, what is that like? Because it must take some time to get used to the action, the sound, to find out how the regulation is. Yeah. Is challenging. It is challenging, but at the same time, it is, um, it makes me better. I, I think it certainly goes with the territory. You're absolutely right. Um, I once had a piano teacher 
well, actually, she's still involved in my musical life. Um, she asked me, I hadn't seen her after so many years. And uh, the first time after however many years it was, I saw her and she said, so, you know, what kind of pra what kind of piano do you have at home? What are you practicing on these days? And in those days, you know, I was, you know, a bit of a starving artist at that time. Uh, you know, I had an I had an upright piano made by a very reputable, very, very good company. Um, um, but certainly not something that I would, uh, you know, wish to play Rachmaninoff third on, you know, in a concert hall. Right, because the action is um, all different. And right. And um, so, it, you know, it wasn't a bad instrument. It, it, it certainly served its purpose for me in terms of practicing and learning repertoire. And I said, well, I'm practicing on a so-and-so. And she said, uh, well, not great, she said. She said, but that's a good thing, she said, because it's amazing how much you can learn about sound production by working on an inferior instrument. Wow. And that is very true. And, you know, when she said that, it, you know, it, 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 it sounded typical of something she would say, like there's always like this burning Eastern European kind of, you know, dark sarcasm humor. <laughs> <laughs> with cigarette smoke around everything she says, you know? <laughs> darling, hey, darling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, at first I, and at first I thought this was just one of those typical kind of moments I was having with her until I realized, you know, one of my all time idols, one of my heroes, uh, someone I've looked up to from the time I was 10 years old until now, um, Christian Zimmermann. Christian Zimmermann grew up um, where he, at a very young age, he learned to essentially build pianos based on spare parts. You know, oh, he man. learned the anatomy of the instrument. Um, um, so, like a doctor would you know, learn a human anatomy. And, um, and that's, I'm sure has something to do with how he uh, would become one of the most technically proficient to say nothing of the profundity of his musicality and musicianship, but a technical master, you know. Um, and when I say, technique I don't just mean you know hitting all the right notes <laughs> you know I mean technique as it is meant to be technique in the service of music and and in the production of the sound that you want technique is not just hitting the right notes technique is producing the sound that you hear in your inner ear before you produced it that's how you produce it. Yeah. That's exactly you know. how you produce it. Exactly yeah. right. Well, that's beautiful. So if it's good enough for Christian Zimmerman, it's certainly good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some wonderful live videos of him with Bernstein in Vienna uh, at a pretty young age. They're just remarkable. Just remarkable yeah. playing. Yeah, super yeah. stuff. Listen, Terrence, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time. You are a wonderful person and an amazing pianist. And I look forward to the next time you and I can collaborate and make some wonderful music together. Thank you so much. Likewise, thank you for having me. Good My to pleasure. see you. Best of luck in your Greek this weekend and have a great time in Florida. Thanks everybody for watching. <laughs>